Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the table for two. I'm excited this week or this month like I am every month. And today my guest is Dr. Charlene Brown. I want to start off with you kind of telling us how does a Harvard physician, medical school, Harvard Medical School physician fall in love with CNAs? Tell us how this happened. How, how did you become to be such a supporter of CNA education, development, and services support? How did I fall in love? All right, let's 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 harken back to my love story. Um, <laughs> I was raised by nurses, um, and there are plenty of CNAs in my family. So I think my affinity for nursing, nursing assistants, um, long-term care began as a child. My mom worked. My mom was a nurse in a in a nursing home, um, and Still? so I I learned early about the care of older adults, and came to appreciate it early. Um, I grew up in New York. You know, if we like fast forward through my life, I've lived all over the country and I used to do work. Um, I don't know if you know this, Laura, I used to do work for USAID. It's like this federal government agency that does international development work. No, and so I was doing global HIV. <laughs> like I used to work on pandemics. So I was doing all this global HIV, tuberculosis, all of this work, which is amazing. But one of the things I learned when I worked overseas was how much more responsibility and respect the, the frontline worker has in healthcare. So, you know, the equivalent of a CNA has, um, might be responsible for an entire community, right? And, and be the source of health information or be the, the person doing outreach. You know, when I decided to focus domestically again, and when I decided to become an entrepreneur, I, I just found I found my way back to um, to the front frontline workers, and I didn't actually want to do a business that was making things better for doctors or nurses because everybody's doing that. Like there's there's no lack of attention, there's no lack of attention to the <laughs> to the other branches of healthcare, and so I wanted to work where there was a need, and I. And I care about CNAs. I think they should. I think CNAs should be much more valued and better understood because that being being the person that spends the most time with your client or resident or patient, that is an incredible position to be in, and that is a window into everything. Like you can that the CNA sees everything and can alert you to, to early to potential emergencies to potential. Just anything. And so I, I I don't know if I'm answering your question, but no, you it's, are, it's, a, it's been a journey. And from the beginning, I've, I've cared about CNAs. You, you answered it perfectly. And then you led me into asking, you know, occasionally I'll throw something out there that people don't necessarily want to answer, but it's not because you can't or you won't. It's just a tough one to unpack in such a short time. But why do you think CNAs have been so marginalized in healthcare across the board? Because they're women. Because they're <laughs> women. <laughs> well, there is a lot of truth to that. Thank you. Overwhelmingly female workforce, right? Like overwhelmingly so. I don't know the full history of um, sort of the direct care workforce, but I do know that fields that are dominated by women tend to get less respect. Um, and so I don't know if that's part of it, but I also think that it just our country focuses on, you know, healthcare. Like even during the pandemic, when people were like, you know, shouting outside their windows in appreciation for workers, they were they were shouting out for nurses and doctors. I don't think they even understood that there was this entire other workforce, other other workforce groups that were also putting their lives at risk. They were also sacrificing to keep systems moving forward. So. I can't, I don't know why we don't appreciate them, but I do know that our, I don't think our society even understands they are. how important CNAs are, right? You see on television, every medical TV show, it's like magically, there's only doctors and nurses. Magically, there's nobody else. There's no, like, and the surgical, like it, you, you have these these television programs that seem to operate where health systems have operate. The and television the program, program. All the programs are carry on. We're, are, yeah depicting 
higher level, supposedly, right, than the threat line. Mm -hmm. And uh, that all the fun is on the front line. That's why it, there's so much more to explore there. You get more time <laughs> with people. Because CNAs know how to have fun. <laughs> that is true. CNA Fest taught me that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The cowbells. I will never forget the cowbells. <laughs> you know, the passion lives there. Mm -hmm. I go out and talk to all kinds of people in healthcare management's walking around like they got a slept with a dill pickle in their mouth all night, you know, and nurses, and, you know, the CNAs that I meet, oh, sure, they're negative because they're worn out, they're frustrated and burnt out, but they still seem to find compassion for the client, the patient, the resident who's laying the floor. And I think that is strength very few people in this world have. I to agree. go to a place that's not necessarily happy. People are sick. People are hurting. People are in pain. Mm -hmm. And then to just, and, and have them in your hands, their life in your hands, has been un underplayed. People think they know CNAs, don't they, Charlene? I mean, would you agree? People think that in our world anyway, right? You assume a nurse knows what a CNA is. You assume a doctor. Well, a, lot of, a lot of people like to speak for CNAs, right? It's a lot of, <laughs> Speaking a lot of people of think they Instead of with, letting them speak for themselves, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you and I can be kind of dangerous together, but I think <laughs> our board chair said, that, well, we have a lot of discussions about why CNAs aren't at the table when problems are trying to be solved. Why, do, why do you think, I was going to say, why do you think that CNAs don't get the respect they deserve? They know too much. Hmm. Have them yeah. allowed to be heard. Interesting. They know yeah. what no one wants to face in this country. And that the human suffering at the level of advanced age is awful. And you are expendable in this nation once you reach that advanced age. And only the people in your family and are immediately at your bedside is the only security you have left in your life. And when people know that story, no one wants to hear it. You know, for decades I've been in this field and watched our Senate Aging Committee in D.C. hold one hearing after another. Uh, Senator Grassley was the chair of the Aging Committee <clears throat> for a long time. He'd bring in one family member after another and let them tell a horrific story of the abuse. But once the hearing was over, so was everything else, right? What good does it do to tell it if there's never going to be any action to fix it? And I really think the consumer and the CNAs are the two groups that they want to hear the least from. Because everyone else is willing to always look forward to a solution rather than we got to act today. We got to act today. CNAs aren't high on patience. And I don't mean patience as in people. I mean, we don't have a lot of patience. We have waited, those career CNAs have waited decades to be no, not thanked. We're, they're thanked all the time. There's something deeper than thank you that people don't understand in a caregiver's soul. They don't respond to the same incentives that an average worker responds to. They're adults, they're women. They want to be respected. They want what they do to be respected. And they want the people they care for to be respected. And that seems to be the biggest challenge of all, at least what I've seen in the 30 years here at NACA in representing CNAs and helping them have a voice and articulate that voice so that they are able, you know, to not be too nervous to speak up. But that's just my opinion, Charlene. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it. I, I like it. You're welcome. Tell us a little bit about, so you know that 
one of the passions at NACA has over the last few years since the onset of the pandemic, but we've been having this discussion internally for the last 15 years about becoming a CNA school. Yeah. NACA in itself, right? Recruiting and becoming a CNA textbook and online platform. Well, NACA is a professional association, not an education center. So we went to work building the platform you're aware of that we call the National Institute of CNA Excellence or NICE. And one of our biggest challenges is that how do we duplicate a lab online? And you've solved that problem. Tell Look us about, about it. Yeah. it. Tell us what, what CNA simulations are, why it is, and where it's going in the future. Absolutely. Okay, so CNA simulations is about the exact problem you, you described. During the pandemic, um, when facilities had to shut their doors to all trainees, like CNA students, um, nursing students, everybody, like they shut their doors to everybody. There was a whole industry already built with simulations for medical students, for surgical residents, for nursing students, but there was nothing, there was nothing out there that really focused on the clinical skills part of the education. So you can do didactics, you can do the classroom portion of CNA training from anywhere. You could do that remotely right now on Zoom, you could do it through some kind of, um, you know, self-paced e-learning program. There are all kinds of ways to do that, but solving this problem of how do you teach the clinical skills that CNAs need to need to know how do you do that virtually and so we we went to work and started experimenting with different approaches um, and what we settled on was a story so we we create characters um, so there are older adult characters that have their own personalities and hopes and dreams and memory loss and wh whatever it is there's a character there's another character there's usually a, a, a CNA or a CNA student. And that CNA student is taking care of the older adult character um, in a simulated context. And so every single decision that that CNA has to make about what to say, what to do, where to stand, how to execute each and every step of their skill, how to keep the residents safe, how to keep themselves safe, how to establish privacy, how to establish safety, how to respect their rights, how to deal with unexpected challenges. Like if you discover a pressure injury that nobody knows about, what do you do? Um, or if you are removing the bedpan and you spill the urine, what do you do? Like, so we create all of these um, scenarios where, where things happen and you just have to figure out how to not only deal with the, use critical thinking skills to deal with the, the challenge, but you're doing it in the middle of executing your skills, right? And the skills are not, it's not just, um, you know, step one, two, three, four, on a list of steps to execute, you know, you know, perineal care. It's, it's about connecting to this character. And we use 3D models to yeah. build these characters. And so they, they're sort of a bridge between like what a real person looks like and a cartoon, right? They're sort of in the middle, kind of maybe like you'd see in a video game. But that 3D model, because we're doing that, we're able to build very realistic, very realistic um, experiences, right? So we can we can design a vagina for the perineal care that takes up your entire screen, and you have to figure out how you're, it's it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. But I have to say, I never thought I would say that I designed a vagina in my entire life, but we did. We designed it. We even put a yeast infection in there. And so, um, did you say yeast infection? We did. We gave her a yeast infection. Just making it worse. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But props to anybody that can say vagina on a webinar. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, well, what was well, I saying? Anyway, so the, the point is you're making decisions. And this is how you're executing your skills. And we break the decisions down to such small pieces that we find that people remember. Like they remember because they're doing it in the middle of a story, right? So if they, um, 
they remember to, I don't know, raise the bed or close the curtains um, because, you know, Miss Sophie said, close the curtain, curtains, right? And so it's registering differently than just a list of steps in a, in a book or in a guide. Um, and it's, they're really fun because the characters are really fun. And oh, the- uh, How many yeah. different stories or scenarios do the characters appear in? I mean, how many simulations? Um, well, we have some repeat characters um, oh. so that you can get to know them. And we have, but we what we've done is we've taken um, ADLs and we've created simulations around each of them. So let's say we have a simulation for ambulation with a gate belt. That simulation um, starts with Teresa, who's the CNA student, um, approaching Miss Sophie, who's in the bed. Um, and she, she has to go through everything that is necessary to help Miss Sophie go from lying in the bed to standing to ambulating. Um, and just to figure out how to do that because Miss Sophie has dementia, right? So Miss Sophie, is in the simulation, you're not only just executing the steps of ambulation, but you're also figuring out how to communicate with someone with dementia in a way that is, um, that is risk-free, right? So you can make mistakes, you can say something wrong, or you could choose, <laughs> you can choose, you can choose poorly, and you're not hurting anybody. And so, I think to address your original question, I think it's a great way to simulate the lab experience. And in some ways, there are advantages and disadvantages, right? So the advantages that it brings a sense of realism because you're not play acting with your peers in a lab or on a mannequin. You're actually engaging with characters. And I've been shocked, shocked at how connected people are to these characters. Like they, they, they really get, like there was a, there's a nurse instructor character in the, in the simulations who provides feedback as you go through the simulation. Um, you know, if you make a mistake or, you know, just to learn more. And we used to have a frowning, we used to have her frown when you made a mistake, like, and so many people were so hurt and upset that they had disappointed <laughs> this fictional character in a simulation. I mean, I had to, we had to get rid of the frown. It was like universal, like everyone, they, but it wasn't just like, oh, we don't like the frown. It was more like, I just felt like I let her down. It wasn't how, I love it wasn't it. how, oh, it made me feel terrible because it frowned. It was, I hated to let them down, the, the yeah. patient, the, the client down. It, it is so interesting what we have all learned in working with CNAs and having them part of a process of feedback. And so what I'm hearing is the CNAs that have been involved in taking the simulation so far, this is feedback from them, right? from CNAs. This is definitely feedback from them. Happened. And we and we got feedback from CNA as we were building them as well. So mm -hmm. we didn't just build it in a vacuum. Awesome. Now, how long, um, so how long do does it take to complete a simulation? I mean, is it a long it process? Depends. So it can be. So the, we have a simulation on hand washing. It's not as long as a simulation on catheter care. So like they have varying lengths. Um, I'd say that depending on, we've seen very, very different times. And some of the factors I think that affect the simulation, they could take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, but things like, is English your first language? Um, oh, and we translated them into Spanish and Mandarin because of this. Um, so is English your first language? Um, we found that when English wasn't the first language and they were doing the English simulations, um, that would sometimes take a bit longer. Um, I'd say that how how comfortable and familiar familiar you are with the skill also shapes um, how quickly you go through the simulation. But it's there's no clock. Like we're recording how long it takes, but it doesn't time you out. Like it's, there's no I mean, like it's not something I'm going to blaze through in 15 minutes. No, except for hand sanitizer, right? Hand right. washing. Right, those, right. those you could probably please through 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and is is there value in 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 doing a simulation more than once ever? I mean, do you uh, think we want it as a refresher or just to practice my skills even after I'm certified? Or would it that would it serve a purpose like that? 
I hope so. Um, it's definitely something that we found that some instructors, CNA instructors, will encourage their students to continue with as um, preparation for their clinical skills exam. It's not what we built it for, but we we found that people um, will do the simulations multiple times as part of studying for their clinical skills exam. Um, we offer unlimited access. So the schools that we do partner with, you like you can take it one, you can take a simulation once, you can take a simulation a thousand times. That's what um, I was looking for. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no limits. The simulation lasts for as long as you're a student. Um, and in some cases beyond, because again, the instructors will, like there's sometimes a gap between when you finish your classes and when you test. So well, that's. When we have uh, this in as part of the NICE curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, at, Part of the reason for that is because NICE will soon be becoming a not only a, a, re, a recruitment and certification uh, institute, it will become a continuing education institute as well of best practices and, mm -hmm. and all of these type things. So that's why I had an interest in the answer to that question, because I mm -hmm. see that people would enjoy that even after certification. We're planning to apply... We're working in California now under a grant, and we're planning to apply to the state to see if our students can qualify for continuing education units as well. So I'll keep you posted. Well, um, <clears throat> uh, we haven't talked a lot about it, but we've been asked by a couple of different government agencies to become the certifying, the credentialing uh, board for CNA education. That's and wonderful. So we are moving in that direction to get that so that anyone that creates content can get the, you know, if it passes the editorial, you know, education credentialing piece, it's a stamp of approval. And um, <clears throat> this is what we care about is, you know, yesterday when you and I visited a little bit in our pre-show run up, you know, we talked a little bit about the CNA profession and what what it, what needs to really happen in terms of it becoming a real profession. And it can't just be tied to the employer. Nurses aren't tied to employers. Doctors, they're employed, uh -huh. but their profession isn't tied to the employer. It's not. It's not unless and you want it so to be. Many CNAs be. don't realize that. There is an association here for them that has education, that has information and support services for them. So I'm always um, I'm always looking for collaboration. And Dr. Brown, I have to tell you, you've been so kind to Naka through the last few years. And I can't, I was thinking a little bit ago, how did I, how did we meet? I do think our chief operating officer introduced us, if I'm not mistaken, Matt Cantrell. Did you meet him first? Um, no, I actually met Meg. Um, and I think Meg, Meg before introduced yeah. you. To I'd heard of, I knew about NACA. Like I'd seen, I read about it. And I, I think I was saying to her, yeah, I need to get in touch with these people at NACA. Like yeah. what is, you know, and I had no idea that she was already connected to NACA. Okay. So I think she wrote an intro um, email. Um, once I was connected, I did meet with Matt several times. Like he met up, I think he was in Detroit. Like we overlapped. We were all up in Detroit because we were servicing our Enclave contract there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, just briefly, because we're really about out of time, but I don't think many of our members even know about the Enclave model of care. And it's a really a shakeup of being a disruptor because it is creating CNA departments as part of a bigger nursing department. Mm -hmm. But it allows CNAs to lead their own show, their own department, and have goals. It's One intuitive. of the things I never understood in the seven years I was a CNA is how come nothing we do counts? There's no data. There's no metric. There's no scorecard. Mm -hmm. How do I know if I'm doing a good job or a bad job? Half the time, you didn't get an employee evaluation for a year or two. So you didn't have any feedback at all. The only way a CNA knows if they're doing a good job or a bad job is whether the residents or the families recognize them. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is... Uh, 
it, it, it's just something that I don't understand. It needs to be a profession. It deserves to be one, and it deserves to be lifted up in this country as one to be respected and admired. But what we find is so many people just assume a CNA wants to be a nurse. Yeah. And they're trying to prove that, nope, CNA can be a career all in itself. We actually have that in a simulation where um, we have, like, I think the, the, the resident, like, keeps mistaking her for a nurse and says, do you want to be a nurse? And she's like, no. <laughs> Can, you're going to have to show these to me, Charlene, or let me have mm -hmm. some kind of demo sneak peek, because now I'm more excited than ever. And we have a few minutes left, and I forgot to tell people if they had any questions for you to throw them in the chat, but I see there's 26 communications in the chat. Now it could oh, be, wow. It could be say everybody saying hello to one another. I don't know, but I'm going to yield to Dane Henning, our moderator today or our mm -hmm. Zoom master today to see if any of those are questions that we need to, to address here. Uh, n no questions, uh, Lori and Charlene, but there are a lot of um, comments of uh, affirmation really um, about the concept. Um, Lori, um, somebody had mentioned that when you were talking about the reason why you know, you know CNAs don't get any respect, in your opinion, it was like, uh, Lisa said, uh, uh, damn, Lori, tell it <laughs> uh, to be to quote her there. Um, and then uh, a lot of people was really um, loving the idea of um, or the concept of Charlene's um, uh, simulations and things of that nature. Um, so, yeah, um, really, really just a bunch of positive comments, really no questions. So uh, I guess you guys can just keep on going. That's the way we like Thank it. Man. People are just excited. And um, so there'll be more to come. You, this is not our last visit with Dr. Brown, nor the last you'll hear of CNA simulations, I will say mm -hmm. that. And so um, with all of that, Dr. Brown, and I can't help but call you Dr. Brown, no matter how many times you've told me, Charlene. Yeah, and I've told you many times. You've told me many times. Mm -hmm. But it makes me feel better knowing I got a doctor cares about what we do and it means a lot to our members too thank you very much for giving us your time today and i look forward to the future and what's to come thank you work. so much for having me and i am a forever fan of naka and nice and all of the advocacy and support and you know just just recognition that you offer to the cna profession nationwide so keep doing what you're doing and have a great rest of your day. It was nice to meet all of you. Thank you, Sterling. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll see you next month.